We're here live in Park City, and please introduce yourselves and tell me the name of your film. My name is Rachel Grady, and I'm the co-director of 12th and Delaware. And I'm Heidi Ewing, and I'm the co-director of 12th and Delaware. Give me a two-minute description of your film, or two-line description of your film. Our film takes place on a single corner in a small town in Florida, and on one side of the street is an abortion clinic, and on the other side of the street is a pro-life pregnancy center, otherwise known as a crisis pregnancy center. And the film takes place over a year, and we see what happens um, between, what, what we, it is a metaphor for the, comp, the abortion issue in this country mm -hmm. that takes place on the corner of 12th and Delaware. And how did you guys find the subject? How did you find your, your clinic? While we were making Jesus Camp, we found out of the existence of the Crisis Pregnancy Center, and there are uh, 4,000 of them in the United States, but we hadn't known that before. So the initial idea came during the making of Jesus Camp. Once we met with HBO and, got, and we decided to collaborate together on the film, we went looking for the right location, and we kind of scoured the country, and we found the corner of 12th and Delaware, where our the abortion clinic and the pro-life clinic are sort of locked in a bitter, bitter struggle right across a tiny street, and we thought that was inherently dramatic, and we had found our location. And was there a moment, either during the production of the film or in the edit room, somewhere along the journey that went differently than you had expected? Everything goes differently than you expect. We make documentary films. We had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. Initially, we thought that we would probably follow, follow a couple of girls. Um, that we would meet them in the pregnancy care center, for instance, and then follow them over the next few months, or you know, sort of this the um, a more typical structure that Heidi and I follow, which is following a few characters over many, many months, sometimes many, many years. Mm -hmm. But it didn't work out like that. <laughs> um, it really felt like you know we had the same experience that the two women that run the clinics do, which is they see these girls usually once or twice, and then they never see them again. They, there's a revolving door on both of these places, and it was very organic to their experience, actually. Yeah. It was more sort of um, true to the experience. There is no camera that follows these girls home. It sort of happens within the context of this corner. So in the end, I'm glad that we didn't get that because it's, it's a more, um, you know, it's more accurate. Yeah, it's almost like the characters you follow are the pregnancy care center and the clinic. Exactly. And, and that, that yellow car. The yellow car becomes a character, and the protesters outside become characters. And initially we did go looking for Juno, and Juno does not exist in the United States of America. So it was a, it, a lot of women didn't ever want to be contacted again. And, and so we just left it at that. So it's, uh, it became a different kind of project. Documentary production is always a challenge. If you had 10,000 extra bucks to spend on your film, what would you have used it for? If we had 10,000 extra... A crane. Oh, Definitely we a crane. a crane shot. We don't, we don't have that awesome shot from above of the two <laughs> clinics, you know, that Hollywood shot? Right. So that would have been fabulous. We've never had a, a bucket truck or a crane on any of our movies. But, I mean, it was, it's, they're across the street from each other, but when you start dissecting locations and um, trying to create a, an environment, it was extremely challenging. They had weird doors and weird windows, and it was it was it was hard to get them in a shot that showed what we saw with our mm -hmm. bare eyes. So I'd invest in Ukraine, yeah. Yeah, one shot. We're only missing one shot. Probably would have only used five thousand of it. Isn't that sad? Gone, and then got taken the other five and gone to a great dinner. <laughs> What does it mean for you to be premiering your film, your film here at Sundance? Well, it's the first time we've been at Sundance, actually. This is our third feature film together, and this is the first time we're here. Um, we're thrilled, mm -hmm. and um, I'm glad it's with this film. Um, I'm actually glad it wasn't with our first couple of films. I feel like we're more... Um, seasoned. Seasoned. We're more confident. Um, we can enjoy it more. We don't have to feel panicked, and also it's not, um, it's going to be airing on HBO. Mm -hmm. We can, um, we don't have to uh, waste all of our time Hustling. trying to sell it. Um, it's, it's got a home, mm -hmm. and um, we can just really experience the screenings and the question and answer and feel the people in the room and you know that's for, for me that's been the highlight of the experience and also sort of no no matter how you shake it no matter how you look at it Sundance is still the premier documentary place to premier documentary in the United States I think and all of the industry is here and it's a great platform for an issue film to start getting the attention the film's going to meet and require um, also it's a great place to meet um, you know 
talk about new projects, and we've got a lot of things on our mind that we want to do next. And it's nice to sort of get those juices flowing and talk about talk to potential collaborators. And uh, that's what we've been spending a lot of time doing that as well.